Welcome back. So, now that we've, if you like, met a couple of capillary rheometers, we need to develop a workflow such that we can take the data they generate and ultimately end up with apparent viscosity as a function of shear rate data. Because this is the object of the exercise, don't forget. We've got an unknown fluid and we want to characterise it. We want to see how it behaves. Ultimately, then, we can make a decision about whether we fit it to a generalised Newtonian constitutive law, or whether we might want to fit it to a viscoelastic prediction, or whatever. We need the experimental data to do that, though. And we want to make as few assumptions as possible when we gather that experimental data. Because don't forget, up until now, when we've thought about how we, for example, relate Newtonian viscosity to volumetric flow and pressure drop, we have assumed the Newtonian constitutive law applies. We don't want to make any assumptions of rheology now. We want to develop a workflow that works for any rheology. So, that workflow is called the Rabinovich correction. And we will introduce that first in this part of the lecture. The second thing we need to think about are the practical consequences of making a capillary rheometer. These things typically examine quite viscous liquids, or can examine quite viscous liquids, and so will tend to operate at high pressure. And if you think about the types of pressure transducer that you use for relatively high pressures, they're quite robust, which means they're quite big. And so trying to exactly measure the pressure drop across usually a small diameter capillary is very tricky because you physically can't put your transducers close enough to it and maintain mechanical integrity of the device. And so the data that you gather typically will also have entry flow and exit flow pressure losses included within it. And we need to develop an experimental protocol that allows us to eliminate entry and exit pressure drops from the capillary pressure drop data, which is what we want. That is called the Bagley correction, and we'll examine that in the second bit of this lecture. So, what we're going to do to start with is develop a workflow for how we can calculate apparent viscosity as a function of shear rate for an unknown rheology. We don't want to make any assumptions that will violate this. We're going to start by reminding ourselves how we write down a volumetric flow rate if we know a velocity field. It's simply the integral shown on the blackboard there. And we've used this a lot on the caveat that we know the velocity field, which we've typically obtained by assuming a constitutive law, inserting that constitutive law into a stress balance, working through some integration, and finding our velocity field. We can't do that now. We really can't, because Knowing a velocity field means you've already assumed a rheology. So U of R is unknown. But we can still integrate this. We need to do it by parts as follows. So on the left hand side of the equation we have Q, which is our volumetric flow rate. On the right hand side we have two terms. That first term, if we examine the limits, sets to zero because if we look at the upper limit when we're at the pipe wall, there's, assuming no slip, there's no velocity, so U of R is zero. Regardless of the rheology, U of R will be zero so long as no slip is obeyed. In the core of the flow, well, little r zero anyway, so that term's eliminated. Fine. It just leaves us that second term on the right-hand side, which is an integral involving pi, our shear rate, du by dr, and r squared. Now, on its own, that's quite tricky to integrate. What we're going to do is to introduce a substitution of variables. So the substitution of variables harks back to the first force balance that we did in pipe flow. In white there is a reminder of the key results from that force balance. The lower result is general. Our shear stress tau at any radius little r is equal to r over 2 delta p over l, pressure drop per unit length. We acknowledge that stress varies as a function of radius. And as pragmatic rheologists, that's annoying because very often we want to do an experiment at a set stress. And so what we say is, look, we're going to define a datum, the pipe wall, and say, look, 
the wall shear stress is whatever. And the wall shear stress, tau w, is simply big R pipe radius over 2 delta P over L pressure drop per unit length. If we rearrange the results from those two expressions, divide one by the other, we can see that little r over big R is tau over tau w. And we haven't made any assumption about rheology here. All we've done is just look at a force balance in two different areas and divided the result by itself. So that's the substitution we're going to use. In the second term on the right hand side of the volumetric flow rate expression, we're going to substitute little r for tau. So let's go ahead and do that. Here's a reminder of the integral that we're manipulating and the substitution that we're going to do. And now on the blackboard is the result. So there in yellow is a group of constant terms on the right hand side. Let's quickly remind ourselves where these come from. If we substitute little r for tau, we can see that we're going to get two constants, big R over tau w, and then our variable parameter tau. And so we've got a cubic grouping there, r cubed over tau wall cubed. The Square and r squared over tau wall squared of that cube is simply due to radius squared. It's going to be big R squared over tau wall squared. The remaining r over tau wall term to make it up from a square to a cube comes from dr, because if we think about the substitution for dr, dr is going to be r over tau w, two constants, d tau. Let's think about how our integral limits change. When little r equals zero, tau equals zero. It's a line of symmetry. When little r equals big R, when we're at the pipe wall, that's our datum point. That's our wall shear stress. And so that substitution now allows us to rewrite that volumetric flow integral as shown on the blackboard. Now what we have to do is to play a little trick. I'm going to introduce a rule here that you may have seen before called Leibniz's rule. It's one of the standard rules you find in mathematics. And if we examine it, what it says is that on the left-hand side, the differentiation of a certain integral, when the integral is written in a certain way, is equal to the expression shown on the right-hand side. And if we compare the terms in green in that expression in Leibniz's rule with the terms in green in the volumetric flow expression above it, we'll see that they correspond to one another. Tau wall, in this case, is our big A. Tau is our little a. F of a is our shear rate, gamma dot. And so what we can do is invoke Leibniz's rule to rearrange that integral and write it as follows. I've written this last line on the blackboard in the same format as Leibniz's rule on the line above. So we've got the differentiation of the result of an integral, except that the result of the integral, which was originally shown in green, we can equate because we know it's equal to q tau w cubed over pi r cubed. So we've just substituted what that equals integral is equal to on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, we obey Leibniz's rule and say that that is tau wall squared gamma dot wall. Brilliant. And so we've, we've effectively integrated our expression and we've resulted in something now that we can just use a chain rule on. So there's the result from Leibniz and if we examine that closely, if we differentiate that term in square brackets on the left hand side with respect to tau wall, we end up with the following expression. We can see that the first term on the left hand side is simply a dq by d tau w term with tau wall cubed over r cubed being constant and then we're differentiating again and saying that we're just it's differentiating tau wall cubed which it gives us three tau wall squared equal to tau wall squared gamma dot wall on the right hand side voila there is a solution to our integral so with a little bit of rearrangement and a substitution back using our tau wall equals r over 2 delta p over l, we get the expression on the blackboard shown in blue, which is our wall shear rate, gamma dot w, is equal to a bunch of terms which involve the geometry of our capillary, r, the volumetric flow rate that we can set experimentally, q, and the pressure drop that we can measure experimentally, delta p.
no assumption of rheology needed. And of course, if we think about viscosity, which is our end goal here, our apparent viscosity is simply our wall shear rate, which we know from our pressure drop expression, r over 2 delta p over l, divided by my shear rate, gamma dot wall, which we have just derived for any fluid. So there you go. For any arbitrary fluid, we can get apparent viscosity as a function of shear rate. Let's do an example. So here on the blackboard now is a plot of our volumetric flow rate and average differential pressure drop. This is for a polymer melt. It's for a polyethylene, polythene if you like. The specific grade is Dow NG5056G. It's a film grade polythene and typically this will be used for film, plastic film sheets. The data was taken at just below 160 degrees Celsius in a two millimeter diameter capillary. Now the data, the experimental data, is of course the yellow data points on that graph. What I've done to start with is to put a line of best fit through that because we're going to be doing some manipulation of the data, we're going to be taking some differentials, and whilst we can differentiate these data numerically, you end up with some inaccuracies and artefacts if you do that. It's better if you've got an analytical, ex analytical expression to start with, which you can then analytically differentiate. So there's the line of best fit, of which I know the equation, and I've chosen that line of best fit to have a good coefficient of regression, r squared. So, what I am now doing is plotting wall shear stress as a function of wall shear rate. Remember, wall shear stress, tau w, is derived directly from pressure drop. Big R over 2, capillary radius over 2, delta P over L. My wall shear rate is the result of the Rabinovich correction. And I've put the equation that results from the Rabinovich equation on the blackboard there. And the green dotted line there is the result that I get from applying the Rabinovich correction. So I get wall shear stress as a function of wall shear rate, and then it's simply one further manipulation step to get apparent viscosity as a function of wall shear rate. And remembering that apparent viscosity is simply the wall shear stress divided by the wall shear rate. The green dashed line on there corresponds to a generalized Newtonian fluid, in this case a power law. It doesn't fit particularly well, because there's quite a curve in the experimental data. So you can see al already that if we decreased wall shear rate, we might get a low shear rate Newtonian plateau, which suggests that maybe a Corot fluid would be more suitable for these experimental data. OK, so that's how, for any arbitrary fluid, we get apparent viscosity data. Let's answer the second question, which is, how do we get from our experiments pressure drop just across a capillary? The diagram on the blackboard poses the problem. The green shape there is a typical capillary you might use in a multipass rheometer. The wide diameter parts at the top and the bottom are the barrel in which the piston moves. The narrow section in the middle is the capillary across which we want to know the pressure drop. The conical areas, both an entry and exit, is the transition between the large bore of the cylinder in which the piston moves and the small bore of the capillary, which is where we're making our experimental measurement. Pragmatically, the closest we can get are pressure transducers, which are big because they have to resist high pressures, is inclusive of some of that entry section and some of that exit section. And so the delta P there that I've drawn as an arrow is a schematic representation of what the experimental measurement is actually measuring. OK, so if we use a different geometry capillary, we can change what the domination is of that entry and exit pressure drop. If I use a longer capillary, then the capillary pressure drop is going to be more dominant than the entry and the exit pressure drop. So delta P2 here on the blackboard is going to contain far more of a contribution from the capillary itself than delta P1. The idealized case, delta P3, is the pressure drop entirely across the capillary, which is what we're aiming for. So what we're going to do is repose the expression for wall shear stress, which we had as R over 2 delta P over L, 
to include a number of added radii that would be equivalent to the pressure drop across the entry and exit section. So from delta P over L, we have delta P over L plus alpha R, where alpha is our Bagley parameter. It's about one for a Newtonian fluid, but can be anywhere between 10 and 100 for highly viscoelastic fluids, typically polymeric fluids. Experimentally, we can figure out what alpha is that Bagley parameter, if we do lots of experiments with different aspect ratio capillaries. We, we do with the data is plot pressure drop as a function of capillary aspect ratio, length over radius. Let me show you how it's done. There on the blackboard is a graph of pressure drop as a function of capillary aspect ratio. And let's say that we've done a set of experiments at a fixed volumetric flow rate Q1 and we've used five different capillary aspect ratios. Each of those capillary aspect ratios gives us a different pressure drop. And if we plot the pressure drop out as a function of aspect ratio, lo and behold, what we find is that when L over R equals zero, so when the capillary length is zero, we have a residual pressure drop, which is going to be the sum of the entry and exit pressure losses at that particular volumetric flow rate Q1. OK, so we repeat the sets of experiments at a different volumetric flow rate Q2, and we get the same thing happening. Uh, we get a residual pressure drop at zero capillary length. But what we also see is that if we project into the negative L over R region, we see that these two volumetric flow lines typically intersect. For a third volumetric flow, it will do the same. And again, we'll project that straight line backwards. And we can do it for fourth and a fifth and a sixth set of volumetric flow rates, which I'm not going to illustrate because the graph will get very messy. And what we hopefully find is that the intersection point where pressure drop equals zero is at a common intersection on all those volumetric flow rate lines. And that x distance between the point of intersection and x equals zero, or L over R equals zero, is alpha, which we can then put into our pressure drop and our, to our wall expression. And that is how we correct our pressure drop. We now know the number of added radii that the entry and exit regions combined contribute to the overall experimental pressure drop. So we can subtract that, leaving us just with the capillary pressure drop. Let's recap a couple of key points. We've covered a lot in this little section. We've looked at the Rabinovich equation, which gives us apparent viscosity as a function of shear rate for any arbitrary fluid. And it's these apparent viscosity data to which we can then fit a generalized Newtonian expression or viscoelastic expression. We noted when we're doing that, it's best to smooth the experimental data because it gets rid of any hiccups that then might give you slightly inconsistent data at a later stage we reminded ourselves that real capillary rheometers cannot measure the capillary pressure drop exactly. There's going to be contributions from entry and exit pressure drops due to the mechanical positioning of the pressure transducers. We've seen how to correct for this entry and exit pressure contribution with the Bagley correction, which is essentially doing a number of experiments with a number of different capillary aspect ratios at a number of different volumetric flow rates.